her ideas have become pivotal to the Tea Party movement. Here are some signs from uh, recent rallies. She's almost, or maybe she really is, more powerful today on the political right than she was when she was alive. And so here we return to this fundamental paradox of Ayn Rand, that many adopting her ideas today remain unaware of her atheism and the original goals of her work as she created it. They take Atlas Shrugged as prophecy without realizing it was created to explicate and promote an entirely new moral system. Now, some of them are aware, but they consider it unimportant, and they write to me to say, well, it's really insignificant that Rand was an atheist. That really wasn't a big part of her thought. And after eight years of research, I have to respectfully disagree. The social values she promoted came from an explicitly secular, even anti-religious context. So why are they so popular among religious believers today? So we could talk about this as the ability of people to hold irreconcilable ideals in their mind, which I think is true. But I like to go back to the broader sweep of American history. Now, Rand was right to recognize that religious ideas did, in many ways, underlie the politics she opposed in the 1930s. She got it wrong about communism. That was a secular movement, or really a replacement religion. But many American political ideas and the ideals that unlaid the creation of the welfare state were religiously inspired in important ways. Many of them can be linked to or traced back to the social gospel, a conviction that Christians had a duty to shape the world in their image and to be their brother's keeper. The idea that it was important to make sure government and individuals responded to the needs of the, the neediest and the poor. Now, the social gospel, as historians understand it, began in the 1880s, and it peaked just around the time Rand came to America. So these were the set of ideas that she was reacting against. But even as she attacked them, religious ideas in America were changing. As the Cold War unfolded and the United States felt menaced by Soviet communism, there was a broad rediscovery of the individual. Instead of the social gospel, in religious circles, there was more of an emphasis on individual, personal salvation. And it's this more individualistic form of Christianity that can resonate more easily with Rand's ideas today. At the same time, the climate of the Cold War in the 1950s made Rand's atheism seem genuinely dangerous. When Chambers criticized her in 1957, he was deeply afraid, genuinely afraid, that an atheistic politics of the right could gain ground in America. Today, it's harder to imagine a popular politics of the left or the right that is not inflected by and indebted in some way to religion. So in light of this, Rand's atheism becomes less of a threat. We don't worry so much about godless communism, so we, we, we're not so worried um, about godless capitalism. Today, those who are aware of Rand's views on religions usually don't bother to attack her like Chambers did. They simply say she got it wrong. With Rand long dead and buried, it's much easier to take from her what you choose. It's easier to say Rand's ideas about religion were wrong, but her ideas about the state, about government, about individualism are right. Or to say Rand's ideas about religion are wrong, but the moral system she promoted, that's still uh, valid. Now, I certainly believe that Rand is open to interpretation. I don't think we need to take all of her views or none of them. But I do think it's important to acknowledge and understand the roots of Rand's ideas. Rand argued against the whole suite of traditional values on both a personal and political level. She promoted selfishness, traditionally understood as a vice, as a virtue. She argued that a person's worth should be measured solely by their achievements not by the relationships they had with others. She said that the highest value was the pursuit of your own interests. And she writ these, novel, not these values, she writ these values large in her novels and her politics. One of the things I like most about Rand is that she questioned the unquestionable. And she was always provocative. One of her favorite sayings was, check your premises. By this she meant, examine your ideas and beliefs deeply and make sure you know just how and why you hold the beliefs you do. I think it is still good advice today. Thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take questions.
got me interested in Ayn Rand is a question. Um, so I, on the most basic level, was a doctoral student looking for a topic. And um, as I was sort of casting around for a topic, everywhere I would go, I would see somebody reading an Ayn Rand novel. Like it was sort of uncanny, like on the bus. My friend's reading it. He never reads any books. Why is she reading that? You know, just. And so I thought, well, let me go learn a little bit more about her. And I went to the library and I checked out all the books written about her. And most of the books were very personal. Um, uh, they were people who were very angry with her, who once followed her and were very angry. They were people who um, thought she was the greatest thinker in the world. And, and, and but there wasn't much good information about her. So I thought, sort of, jackpot. Here's, here's a place we need, it's someone who's hugely significant, still being read, and we need to know more about her. Now that's one set of reasons. Other reasons are that she allowed me to dig into so many of these issues I was interested in. Um, what are the values that underlay our ideas about economics? Um, I, I love reading novels. You know, I was a historian, but I could just as easy have been a scholar of English. Um, there were just so many interesting threads that came out of her that it was a wonderful topic to write on because I had a central focus, yet so many things I could examine in that way. Wow, that's a very rich question. Let me um, figure a couple ways into it. First, to your first point about children, this is a very common question that people have about Rand or a common thing they notice. And one thing that Whitaker Chambers claimed actually incorrectly, there are no children in Atlas Shrugged. Well, there are a few children, but they're very peripheral. And the whole business of raising and bearing children is doesn't fit very well with this philosophy because it, it does entail certain sacrifices even if it's something that you want to do in the greater scheme. And Rand herself was completely uninterested in children. And for many people, that's where the philosophy breaks down because it's not speaking about this fundamental part of the human experience. In terms of selfishness and selflessness, um, I mean, it's, it's clever that Rand transitioned from you know, Christianity in her early unpublished writing to altruism. But she really was reacting to this specific uh, idea of altruism defined by Auguste Comte, which was self-sacrifice. And she always said, you know, nobody should be forced to sacrifice themselves to anybody else. And a lot of people say, like, you, whoa, like, self-sacrifice, that's pretty heavy. Like, is anybody doing that? I mean, sure, we go back to the, you know, medieval tradition of, and people in religious orders, like, sure, maybe there's a genuine sacrifice. But is that what religious practice means in reality? Um, I think, I think, and then you get to your last point, black and white thinking, absolutely. Rand was a black and white thinker, and, and she defended that. You know, she said, there's a yes or no, there's a right or wrong, there's no middle ground, and that permeates all of her thinking. So she did create these binaries, and that's when people go into her work, it's just, they, they feel like they understand the entire world, because they can sort everything into different categories, and then, um, you know, many people have the experience of there's some gray here, there's some more complexity here. So um, I hope that gets to some, some of your questions. Um, that's a, well, to, <laughs> to answer that question, you should read Atlas Shrugged, because she laid it out in Atlas Shrugged in many ways, and that was Galt's Gulch, right? Does that make sense to you? So Galt's Gulch, 
um, all the producers of the world who are being overtaxed and overregulated retreat to a valley in Colorado, which actually is Ure, Colorado, which you drove through on a road trip. So it's actually, you can go to Gulch Gulch if you want to. Uh, it's a beautiful town known for its ice climbing. And that's kind of the idea, right? That nobody, um, no, everybody was contributing what they could do and nobody was taking from each other and they all swear the oath when they come in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the question is, that's, that's Gulch Gulch is a small group of people. How do you go from there to a society? And I think that that's one of the things in Rand that's not done, that's not complete. And when you look at, a lot of people have written about her relationship to the libertarian movement. And a lot, you know, libertarians loved Rand and she was a Bible of the libertarian movement. A lot of people say, libertarians haven't been successful politically because they're wedded to this sort of fictional ideal of a, a society where um, there, there is no politics, there is no compromise, there is none of the, the huge clashing interests of a large industrial society. So how you go from that fictional vision to mapping that in reality, that, that has yet to be done and it may not be able to be done, but you know, what Rand always said about her fiction is it's an ideal. It's meant to inspire, but it, le it leaves a lot undone. It's, it's a book of fiction, it's not a political text, you know? conception, uh, she liked to use the contrast between individualism and collectivism and say that the real problem um, with communism was that it subsumed the individual to the collective good. And similarly, Christianity as she understood it or religion as she understood it taught people to achieve salvation through subverting their own selfish interests. Um, did she ever respond to the idea that, you know, it, a, a secular capitalism would become just like communism. She just thought that was so absurd, it wasn't worth responding to. The real problem with communism for her was it failed to appreciate the individual, and since capitalism, and then these are ideas that you know we can take back to you know Adam Smith dependent on self-interest, each person doing his part, coming together. If if you were truly individualistic, you would have a capitalist society, and they would they were they were inseparable. Right, so um, you couldn't have an authoritarian capitalist society, which, you know, in light of what's happening in some parts of the world today, is. on a, a play written by Murray Rothbard called Mozart was a Red. And this is a spoof of Ayn Rand um, that you know, sort of features all the worst parts of the collective. I didn't um, dig too deeply into the psychodynamics of the collective here, but they're interesting to say the least. And uh, Rothbard was a famous uh, libertarian theorist who, uh, I, I talk about this in some detail in my book, so I'll kind of summarize real quick. He met Rand, he hated her. He read Atlas Shrugged, he fell in love with her. He entered therapy with Nathaniel Brandon and then he hated both of them. And <laughs> as part of that recovery process, wrote this play. Um, Rand didn't know anything about it and she, I mean, she met Rothbard and the, one of the nubs of contention was that Rothbard was an anarchist. Um, you know, he believed you didn't need a state at all. And Rand said, no, that's ridiculous utopian thinking. You need a state, but it has to be very limited. It's limited to law enforcement enforcement of contracts and national defense. And so her main issue with Rothbard was, um, you know, we've presented to him all these, you know, bulletproof arguments about the need for a minimal state and he's still an anarchist. Now there were also some issues that he was married to a Christian. How could, an, you know, an atheist be married to a Christian? So as far as I know, she didn't know anything about this play, but it does have a cult following and I'm delighted that you put it on. Um, so good for you. And it's, 